Chairs No Waiting, episode number 337, Fix It Shop Talk. Two Chairs No Waiting is brought to you each week by the fine folks over at Weaver's Department Store. Drop by over at weaversdepartmentstore.com and pick up some of your favorite Mayberry items. They have all kinds of new stuff right now, a bunch of new t-shirts. It's summertime. Head over there and check it out. We also have the uh, 2016 Andy Griffith Show wall calendar. So head over and check out all the new items, new T-shirts, uh, Barney's No Jerk, all kinds of stuff at weaversdepartmentstore.com. Two Chairs No Waiting is also brought to you by donations from listeners just like you. Thank you for your support. Hello, everybody. I'm Alan Newsom, your host for Two Chairs No Waiting. And it is always great to be here in Mayberry with you guys. I uh, always have such fun uh, just being able to visit and uh, just spend a little bit of time talking about the Andy Griffith Show, my favorite. Uh, we've been doing this for a long time, but not as long as The Bullet, the Andy Griffith Show Rio and Rogers Club's official newsletter has been going out. Uh, it was originally The Bullet and then eventually became uh, The E-Bullet. So now you get The E-Bullet, which is delivered directly to you. But if you're old like me, you have copies of the original bullet. Boom. There they are. I got it right here in my hand. There you can hear it flopping around. This issue is from November the 15th, 1997. Has a picture of uh, Betty Lynn on one side and uh, Bernard Fox on the other. And now what we're going to be talking about, this is something I don't think we've ever done on the podcast because we've done uh, we've done stuff out of the bullet before, but we've never actually done these. Jim Clark, the presiding goober of the Andy Griffith Show Real Watchers Club, had a segment in the bullet that was called Emmett's Fix-It Shop Talk. And Emmett's Fix-It Shop Talk... Uh, it was a great segment that he did uh, in there, and it was for it was a forum for readers' questions and comments. So people would write in to the Rio and Watchers Club, to Emmett, to Dear Dear Fix It Shop, and the Fix It Shop would uh, answer the questions that were asked uh, by folks that wrote in. I thought this would be a really fun thing to do here on the podcast because, uh, like I said, this is from nineteen. 97. So I believe even if you read this back in 97, it being, you know, 18 years later, is that right? Yeah. You might not remember. You might not. It's not quite 18 years, but November would be. So you might not remember the answers to some of these questions. So we're going to check into them again and uh, and see what uh, Emmett's questions were or what he, the questions he got and the answers that Jim Clark came up with so let's uh let's get a little background music because we need some music for that uh how about this one that's a little bit fast for fix it shop talk let's try another one. Oh, there we go that's better it's still just about as fast but let's have some fun with emmett's fix it shop talk thank you jim clark for allowing us to do these things so let's head over to emmett's fix it shop and see what's been going on over there with Emmett and the and the boys. They've uh, they've been getting some questions and answers. So let's go and check out what we've got. Let's see. Our first question to the Fix It Shop was in the episode Opie the Birdman, my favorite. Uh, where did the idea for that particular storyline come from? Was the was the dead bird real? And, uh, you know, where did the baby birds come from and what kind were they? Wow, there's some questions. So we got multiple questions on our very first question here to Emmett's Fix-It Shop. And the response from the Fix-It Shop is, in Professor Brower's class, which you guys may remember that Neil Brower, uh, we've had him on the podcast before, in Professor Brower's class column that appeared in the October 3rd, 1995 issue of The Bullet, Opie the Birdman writer, Harvey the Bullock, told Neil Brower this. He said, quote, My memories about the origin are unclear. I'm uncertain whether or not the story originated from the Griffith Show seminars, wherein, uh, you know, a half dozen writers would meet two or three days in the offseason with Aaron Rubin, Sheldon Leonard, and uh, sometimes Andy to collectively pitch story ideas, 
or it may have been an individual story idea that I pitched to Aaron. However, I know it was one of Aaron's favorites and he scheduled it to open one season. Many fans and critics also rate Opie the Birdman among their very favorites. The episode was also ranked as the 24th best television episode of all time in a recent TV guide listing. Of course, the Andy Griffith Show fans think the Birdman should have been ranked even higher, and uh, several other Andy Griffith Show episodes should have easily joined, joined it in the top 100, though none did. Uh, but that's another can of worms we'd rather not get into, even though Winkin, Blinken, and Nod would surely not have minded if we did. All right, the bird playing the mother bird was not killed. Just so rest, your, rest yourself there. It was not killed. The dead bird was portrayed. <laughs> it was portrayed uh, by either a stuffed bird that died earlier or by a fake bird. Yeah. We, uh, we never really get the opportunity to ask Ron Howard about the, his memory of the bird, but someday we will. Uh, as for the type of bird, the mother bird looks like a mockingbird to some people. Uh, that would be nice to have uh, as a tip of the hat to Harper Lee, if it were the case. But uh, Keen Mayberry observer Paul Mulick thinks that maybe the tail feathers weren't long enough to be a mockingbird. As for the baby birds, it's really hard to say for sure what kind they are. They could be baby lake loons, as far as we know. They didn't look red crested, but uh, I threw that in, not, not the answer. Uh, more than likely, the production assistant in charge of finding birds simply borrowed whatever baby birds were available that week at a local nature center or zoo. Of course, there were probably at least two sets of baby birds used. Uh, one trio for the early scenes and another for when the birds flew away. Maybe there's an ornithologist. I hope I said that right. A bird studier. <laughs> Among our listeners and readers who can shed light on the variety of birds. Winkin', Blinkin', and Nod wait for information about their family tree with bait breath. But I'm fine. <laughs> All right, so our next question. It says, uh, Dear Fix-It Shop. Dear Fix-It Shop. In the episode Big Brother, that was episode number 217 of the Andy Griffith Show, a teenager, and that's a color episode, calm down, a teenager named Tommy Parker is played by an actor named Scott Lane. My wife... Police, he resembles a young Nathan Lane from Broadway and screen fame. Uh, is this uh, indeed him or maybe his brother? Uh, that question came to us from uh, Gary Matthews from Morristown, Tennessee. All right. So was it Nathan Lane? Now, you guys may or may not remember Nathan Lane. And uh, Nathan Lane, uh, he was in The Birdcage and some other uh, movies like that. Uh, you know, he did something, I forgot, I think Birdcage, was Robin Williams in that one? Anyway, he was in that. Well, Scott Lane, or Tommy Parker, who played uh, the brother of the, the uh, girl that uh, Howard Sprague started liking, you know, he came over to be a big brother to Tommy. Uh, to this Tommy Parker, but uh, Howard really liked his sister, who is played by same actress who plays Luann Poovey, Elizabeth McCray on Gomer Pyle. Okay, so Scott Lane was the actor's name. Now, Scott Lane, I did a little looking for this and was able to find some stuff, but uh, before we get into that, let's see what uh, the Fix It shop has to say because, you know, their answers are probably better than mine. So let's head back here. This is a response from, from the Fix-It Shop. Uh, Jim says, We have not been able to locate an actor named Scott Lane as still being registered in the Screen, Actor, Screen Actors Guild. Now remember, this was in 1997. Okay, so they were trying to find out, Jim was, uh, if uh, Scott Lane was uh, Nathan Lane or related. Our research, our research did not turn up a brother for actor Nathan Lane. 
Uh, perhaps best known for his role in the Birdcage with Robin Williams. Oh, I was right. Uh, who will see enough? Or we do, however, see enough resemblance between the Big Brothers actor and Nathan Lane to wonder if there's a connection between the two. Uh, maybe another reader will be able to set the record straight. So I did a little bit more research because, you know, back in 97, we didn't have as much Internet capability as we do now. So I went out and looked up information about Nathan Lane and uh, on the Wikipedia article about Nathan Lane, I did find out he has two brothers. One's brother's name is Daniel Jr. and the other is Robert. So neither is Scott. Okay. I also looked up Scott Lane in the uh, Internet Movie Database, IMDb. Turns out Scott Lane went by the name Edmund Lane. And he passed away December 12th, 2011. His real name was Scott Barry Lane, B-A-R-R-Y, Barry. Scott Barry Lane. He was born January 27th, 1951 in New York City. He was an actor and a writer. And it was indeed him who appeared as Scott Lane, because that was his name, Scott Lane, but he went by Edmund later in his life, uh, who appeared on the Andy Griffith Show. So Edmund Lane and Scott Lane, same person, but not the same person as Nathan Lane. Okay. All right. So that was, uh, i just clear that up for you there, because I did check also, because I wanted to make sure, because, you know, maybe names have changed, but... Uh, Nathan Lane was born uh, in New Jersey, so he was from New Jersey, so I wondered. But they are indeed were not the same person. does not mean they may not have been related. So good eye to those who thought that they looked similar. All right, next question. Dear Fix-It Shop. Dear Fix-It Shop. That's a good, a good way to start. I know the Andy Griffith Show was filmed at Desilu Studios. So the soundstage for the show was the soundstage for the show on what is now the Paramount lot. Also, where exactly was the 40-acre shooting area located? Does it still exist for shooting purposes today? Uh, if so, do any of the buildings used on the Andy Griffith Show still exist? This is from Brandon out in Texas, Dallas, Texas. All right, so the answer to this one uh, is Desi Lou Studios. Uh, it was a home to the Andy Griffith Show, uh, the Danny Thomas Show, the Dick Van Dyke Show, Gomer Pyle USMC, I Love Lucy, and many others uh, were located at, and it was located at uh, 846 Ch Chahanga Boulevard in Los Angeles. The Andy Griffith Show was filmed on sound, sta sound stages one and two. Uh, the studios uh, had been built during World War II and it become pretty run down by the time the Andy Griffith Show completed its run. It had deteriorated uh, so much that by the time Maybear FD was filming, uh, they had to switch in mid-series to Warner Brothers lot. Okay, For a while after that, uh, Ch Chahanga Studios were used mostly for storage. Today, the facilities are, uh, are part of Renmar Studios, it's R-E-N-M-A-R Studios, which rents out its sound stages to others and makes no films of its own. Renmar has no connection to Paramount Studios. Now, this is the case back in uh, 1997, okay, so this may not be true now. It seems like it's actually Red Studios that has it now, but I didn't check on that. 40 Acres was actually part of the old MGM lot at Culver City. Scenes used uh, using the exteriors of buildings were shot there. Uh, the lot no longer exists. As far as we've been able to determine, all the old Andy Griffith Show sets were destroyed. Even the Return to Mayberry sets were dismantled immediately after the filming in 1986. Oh, that hurts so bad. Isn't that terrible? We talked about Myers Lake a few weeks ago, and uh, that is the one place you can still head out and check out and be part of Mayberry history yourself. Okay. <clears throat> All right, so here we have another question. This question is from Rick. 
And he says, I'm curious to know who was the announcer for the Andy Griffith Show. He's from Ohio, Rick from Ohio. The response from the Fix It Shop says, Mayberry uh, Minuteman, Dennis Hasty, and fellow Ohioan, <laughs> not Hawaiian, Ohioan, uh, Dennis is also from Ohio, uh, ferreted out the answer a while back to this question. The announcer was Colin Mayle. He was a former radio announcer in Cincinnati who moved to Hollywood to be part of the motion picture business. Uh, believe it or not, Colin Mill actually appears in an episode of The Andy Griffith Show. He played the game warden uh, called Peterson in the episode, but listed as Wormster in the credits. Uh, in the episode Andy and Helen Have Their Day, episode number 140. Uh, he was also a singer on the Dottie Mac show in the mid-50s and the MC of This Is Music, an ABC TV on ABC TV in the late 50s. So Colin Mel. You may not have known that. There's a lot of a lot of this stuff I have heard over the years, but I don't know how many other people have heard some of it. I, I've started to realize just because I've heard it doesn't mean you have. <laughs> so I'm trying to let you know about it. Dear Physics Shop, I got two questions. That's not what he says exactly. Two questions. First, I've always thought uh, the exclusion of Ken Berry, Hocal, Arlene Galanka, uh, uh, and others from the return to Mayberry was conspicuous. Does anyone know why they didn't participate? Second, what happened to Mayberry's mayors? In the last, the last mention of a mayor is in the episode The Cannon, number uh, 172. In the last Andy Griffith Show season and during Mayberry RFD, it is implied that Mayberry no longer had a mayor or that uh, as head of the town council, Sam Jones was the de facto mayor. Is this so, or did I miss something? This is from Brent over in New Jersey. Brent. All right, so here's our, here's our answer. The reason the actors you mentioned and others weren't included in the return to Mayberry was primarily because there were already a great many characters in the movie. Far more uh, uh, for, than for any other episode uh, previous in Mayberry. Look at the list of major characters. They had Andy, Helen, Opie, plus a wife and a new baby, Barney, Thelma Lou, Goober, Gomer, Howard Sprague, Six Darlings, Ernest T. Bass, Otis, and even the voice of Aunt B. That's not to mention the new bad guy played by Paul Wilson, Sheriff Candidate Ben, uh, Candidate Ben and Richard Lineback, the scheming hotel owner. Plus, the movie also included Rance Howard as the minister and Karen Knotts playing Opie's assistant. It was cumbersome for the writers. Uh, the they were you know the legends uh, you know Harvey Bullock and Everett Greenbaum to include uh, all of those characters without having the complication of having to figure out a way to smoothly shoehorn in even more, including other RFD characters such as. Buddy Foster and others. Okay, so that's a that's the reason why it uh, there were more not more people. Okay, uh, uh, Buddy Foster, by the way, was no longer an actor. He was Mike Jones and Andy Taylor Jr., who would have been about eighteen years old at the time of the movie. Yeah, he's not on there either. Okay, uh, but uh, the producers uh, figured that uh, most of the general public wouldn't even remember the characters like Andy Jr. and the viewers would understand that uh, simply because of script and budget constraints some memorable citizens and visitors of Mayberry couldn't be included. As for your second question about the mayor that character was essentially phased out for some of the same reasons uh, that some of the characters were not included in Mayberry or, or returned to Mayberry. Richard Kelly has an interesting discussion about the mayors in his outstanding book, The Andy Griffith Show. He quotes executive producer Sheldon Leonard as saying, they, Pike and Stoner, weren't enough uh, to us to be put on a continuing contract basis. You know, so they, they had no valuable function on the show. People with a valuable function were those who created complications for Andy. 
Dr. Kelly disagrees somewhat with Sheldon Leonard. He writes that the majors, quote, did create problems, the mayors, I should say, quote, did create problems for Andy, and their function did appear valuable. On the other hand, there were just so many actors a producer could put on a continuing contract. You know, artistically, the mayor uh, is as important an ingredient for the is an important ingredient for the town of Mayberry, but in terms of a long-term television production, sometimes art must be bent to economic realities, and that's the way it goes. The bottom line was that Barney, uh, uh, Barney Gomer, Otis Goober, Floyd, not to mention Helen Crump and Thelma Lou and Aunt B and Opie could provide more interesting and varied problems on a regular basis than a mayor. Also, the character of county clerk Howard Spray came to, to represent some of the civil service bureaucracy that the mayor had in the show's early years. But by not holding the top office, Howard was given the freedom to have many other dimensions to his character. And while the mayor and Andy could uh, parallel and sometimes confl uh, be conflicting leaders of Mayberry, you know, <laughs> vote conscious politician versus wise sheriff. If Sam Jones had had to deal with a mayor on Mayberry RFD, it would have represented too direct of a conflict. And it would have been harder to portray Sam as a distinctly a people's leader. RFD might have been in danger of becoming a show just about Sam versus the mayor. Plus, from a storytelling standpoint, the character of the mayor had already been written out by the time Sam Jones came along, and it would have been problematic to reintroduce a mayor after an extended absence. Absence. Boy, I can't talk today. <laughs> well, folks, that's just some of the things that if you had had a chance to be a part of back in the day from Emmett's Fix-It Shop Talk. They're still there, and hopefully I'll be, I'm will be. i going to go through some of my old issues of the bullet and see if we can't come up with some more questions and answers like this because I believe these are fun and interesting. At least I think so, and I hope you guys have enjoyed this. So, until next time, I'd love to hear from you. I'd like to hear your questions and answers and all that kind of stuff. I'd love to hear them. You can give me a call at 888-684-8415. You can email me at floyd at imayrear.com or drop by twochairsnowaiting.com and leave a question there. I'd love to have questions like this to be able to try to answer. Or even better, if you ask questions that Jim Clark's already answered, it'll be a lot easier for me. <laughs> now, folks, hey, I, I do appreciate you. I'd love to hear from you. It's always fun to try to answer questions and hear questions and answers like this. So if you have questions about the Andy Griffith Show, even if you think they're silly, I'd love to hear them. Because if you think it's a, a question that needs asking, so does somebody else. So, folks, until next time, we'll see you then right here on Two Chairs. <laughs>